Welcome on a uh, balmy whatever day this is, September 17th. <clears throat> Blue sky and sunshine in uh, Buffalo, New York, headed to uh, mid-80s once again. So our extended summer uh, continues. Hope the same for uh, all of you. I'm John Colmo, pleased to chair the Finance Committee meeting uh, this morning and welcome uh, what I think is a full squad turnout on our end. Uh, Dennis Trainer, B. Gonzalez, Lewis uh, Warren, Cecily Morris, Michael Cusick, and Lori Wheelock is uh, joining us remotely, as well as uh, a small assemblage of uh, Justin Driscoll, Adam Barsky, and their uh, respective <clears throat> teams. As always, this meeting's been duly noticed as required by open meetings law. And with that, I'm pleased to formally call the meeting. Uh, to order. We've all had the opportunity to uh, review uh, the agenda materials that were presented to us, unless there's uh, uh, any thoughts or recommendations for amendments there too, I'd ask for a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. So moved. There was a, at least a second in all of that. All in favor, aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? <clears throat> motion carries. We have a uh, full agenda uh, for this meeting, followed by a couple others uh, as well. Uh, so we'll do our best to uh, keep the robust discussion moving. But as we typically do, uh, we'll start uh, with a bit of an executive uh, session. And uh, for that, I'd ask for a motion to conduct uh, such session uh, in, in accordance with the pursuant to Section 105 of the Public Officers Law. So moved. Second. Hi, right, uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, Dennis Lewis, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Uh, we'll be back with you as uh, soon as uh, we practically can. Thanks very much. Uh, if I could, I'm going to ask for a motion to resume our meeting in open session. So moved. So moved. Second. Uh, I got a set for a second and third in there. Uh, Karen will sort that out. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, we're back in open session. And as always, uh, no votes were taken uh, during uh, the executive session. Uh, we were all presented uh, with a list of uh, contractors upon whom uh, we will uh, be voting uh, later in this meeting. Everyone's had an opportunity to respond uh, to any conflicts they do or don't have. Uh, I'll assume, unless you so indicate, there are no additional uh, changes or notifications to be provided. Uh, set up front, uh, we've got uh, a number of uh, action items uh, to uh, discuss, uh, review, and uh, bring to uh, a vote. Uh, so we've got a full lineup with uh, Adam and Lori and team. Uh, Adam, uh, as he typically does, will uh, kick us off. So, Adam, you got a handful of uh, items for us to ponder. Uh, the floor and the podium is yours. Sure. Good morning, trustees, Good morning. NIPA colleagues, and members of the public. You hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we're going to uh, update for the results through July first, and then we'll give you a year-end forecast. So the results through July, uh, we were uh, 93 million of net income uh, versus target of 48 million. Uh, the same themes that we've discussed in the previous meetings continue to hold, which are that uh, our generation is a little bit higher than was planned based on better weather conditions, better hydro uh, flow, and um, favorable hedge settlements against lower prices, so offsetting energy prices going lower than was originally planned. So we continue to be ahead um, from the generation standpoint. Transmission revenues are also stronger. Some of that is based on the, uh, the annual true up that we do ahead of the July 1st uh, transmission uh, rate filing year, as well as some positive um, terminations we've had from FERC regarding uh, cost allocation, other um, items that we had uh, petitioned for, which improve uh, 
our uh, recoverability and, and revenues from transmission. The non-utility revenues are pretty much holding to plan, which is really a function of uh, the energy efficiency work that we're doing and how that work is according, uh, progressing according to plan, which it seems to be uh, progressing exactly according to plan. And uh, expenses um, coming in you know, slightly below um, current year uh, based on uh, O&M expenses coming in lower, but we do see some of those uh, uh, going higher uh, for the remainder of the year, which we will talk about later uh, in the presentation. On the non-operating side, uh, interest income is uh, stronger uh, than was originally planned based on interest rates being higher for longer than was expected uh, last year. Uh, and we'll talk about where we see that going as well in the future. If we go to the next page, our, our year-end projection is the same uh, that we uh, provided guidance for last meeting uh, to be in that $162 million range um, with you know slightly lower downside, some higher upside, but we believe we'll certainly be within that, that range and we don't see the risk of things uh, you know, coming in much lower, uh, even though we've had some um, other uh, news or interest or things that came in that are a little bit higher than expected, particularly with the um, pension expense from the state, even though they had a good performance in the stock market, uh, the, the pension expense that has been sent to uh, enterprise entities like NIPA uh, were much higher than the budget originally anticipated. A lot of that is attributed to the changes that the state made in the tier six uh, category for employees. Uh, they continue to um, roll back some of those changes and that has a, a cost on the entire system. Um, but that's something that the legislature had approved to uh, you know, make tier six more attractive to employees to either stay or to be recruited into the workforce. Uh, so that uh, we may see that to continue. Uh, also, we had an accounting change that we had implement this year, which is called GASB 101, which is how we accrue uh, unused vacation and sick leave. That is also uh, higher than we had originally budgeted for uh, by around $20 million. <clears throat> so uh, we're, we're going to have to um, you know, provide for that uh, in the year end forecast. But other than those uh, changes, nothing really that I see on the horizon that will have us uh, not meet our targets or even meet the projections that we're putting forth here. So uh, with that, I'll ask for any questions. Uh, Excuse otherwise me, we can move Adam, on. Uh, uh, is anybody else having trouble seeing the, the slides? Um, no, we're no, okay. No. Okay, slides. it's our end then, we'll, we'll, we'll try to fix it from yeah. our end, yep. It's, it's flashing back on and off. It's, thanks. Yeah, maybe you can just use your uh, iPad or something, uh, Dennis. We're, he's following along with the materials that we have. Yeah, we, we see it. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, no problem. Uh, apologies for the technical issues. It's been a bumpy one this morning. Sorry for that. Um, so, Adam, your level of comfort uh, with uh, looking in your crystal ball for the next 100 days, you're feeling good about uh, how the plane will land at the end of the year. At this point, nothing... Uh, that you foresee uh, risk level in terms of uh, operating issues for us to end the year on a real positive note and be well positioned to take into 25. You're feeling really good about that at this point. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think we are uh, in position to, you know, certainly uh, meet and exceed our targets. Uh, as far as, you know, energy prices uh, are concerned, we are very well hedged with very little downside right. there. I mean, there's always some unexpected uh, potential item that could come up as an emergent uh, work at any of our sites. Uh, we do make sure that we have some um, provisions set aside in the event that something like that were to happen. So we do think we are uh, prepared for even you know, uh, an unexpected event. So I think we're pretty confident that we're gonna end the year along the lines that we're presenting here. Terrific, well, kudos to you and your team, but just on the organization in total for continuing to uh, very efficiently and effectively uh, run and manage the business. So uh, well done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Canal. Next item is, yep, is the release of the funds for the, for the fourth quarter. Uh, as you know, we do this every quarter. 
it's still in line with what was approved in the budget. We see canals tracking uh, to budget, uh, so we don't see any issues there about needing a, a larger release at this time. So uh, I think everything is working according to plan with the canals. Uh, canals, give us a drive-by, a float-by uh, in terms of the summer. Good summer. Uh, level of activity. I'm looking at Joe. Uh, yeah, so. what's, what's the calendar? You know, for the timeline, uh, give us a little so, recap. So right now, everything's on track in terms of the uh, navigation season. We should be able to go right to the end. Um, and the end is it'll be in. Uh, um, I don't know the date off the top of my head. Dave will be on to report that a little bit later. So like October 15th yeah, like or something. October. Another I'm month. Right. Another month or so. Right. So um, so the before we start closing and start our winter maintenance program, we're all lined up and ready for that. We did have a couple of uh, emergent issues that were uh, driving the numbers a little bit, but we've actually adjusted our schedule from some things in uh, later years. So we're going to be able to to carve that back and get uh, hit the targets that uh, Adam put in front of us. Uh, navigation, Dave will probably touch on a little bit uh, later, but uh, um, the traffic has been a little bit lighter than in previous yeah. years. Uh, but that said, we've had no major uh, issues with any of the infrastructure and uh, everything's going as planned. What do we attribute that to? We, so we've been promoting canals and all that more than yeah, ever, I think, right? just, it, they, There's no real, I don't think it's a scale that there's any major cause for it. I think it's just a, just a little bit, uh, you know, whether people are available or took other right. vacation options or things like that. I think that's all there is to it in that. B, I mean, any comment from the boater community? I mean, uh, you guys are out, weren't out there representing this summer or what? Have not been on the water this summer due to a bunch of other reasons. So sorry about that. This is terrible. You and, you, you and others. Okay. All right. Um, we'll come back and we'll tie all these together in one motion. But anything else for Joe or Adam on the release of the canals fund? So expectations are uh, going to come in right in on budget or within relevant uh, parameters for budget for the year. Yeah, that's the forecast. We're on, we're on track. Any other questions on the canals before we move forward to a couple of uh, financing and funding uh, matters? Okay, Adam. Okay, the, uh, the next few items we'll talk about are really around um, positioning NIPA to help um, achieve the goals of expanding renewables in the state and uh, utilizing will be various tools that are available to us or that we can create or that we've asked for in the legislation to give us maximum flexibility, as I mentioned, to enable uh, the maximum amount um, of renewables that we can possibly do uh, you know, within our, our uh, capacity and overall, you know, um, which is feasible and advisable for the, for the board to undertake. So the first item here is uh, one of our first applications of it is to uh, ask for an approval to make certain assignments and enter into prepay agreements on behalf of our certain customers. In this case, it's New York City and the, and the Port Authority, of New York, New Jersey, uh, who both have entered into a series of solar uh, PPAs or you know, um, power purchase agreements uh, with various developers to uh, create solar projects. Uh, what we're asking for here is uh, NIPA right now is as uh, the board has approved in the past and authorized us to enter into these back-to-back -back, uh, power purchase agreements and power sale contracts with these customers. Uh, what we're asking for here is to assign these to uh, a new entity that was created at the Empire State Development Corp, uh, which is going to be called New York Energy Development Finance Corp. And it is a conduit issuer of tax exempt bonds, and they will actually issue bonds to prepay the power under these contracts and then enter in, a, they will enter into an agreement with a uh, supplier of power. In this case, it's Jay Aaron, a, a subsidiary of Goldman Sachs, and they will uh, provide that power and be able to do it utilizing the proceeds from the tax exempt bonds. And that will actually provide a savings to the customers on their uh, the price of the power they're buying for the solar projects, in in general around ten percent of their power purchases. But uh, what we've also been able to do was add to that some of their market purchases that they 
uh, do on a regular basis with us into the transaction, and which will also provide a source of savings. And when you add that to the uh, power purchase agreements they've entered into for the solar projects, it will actually give them a 30% savings on what they would have otherwise had to pay. Uh, we'll say that as far as this transaction goes, this is, will not be debt of uh, NIPA, it will not be debt of the state of New York or debt of our customers, it will be debt of this conduit issuer that was created uh, for this particular purpose. Um, and this is a uh, something that is a first here in New York, uh, both uh, NIPA and LIPA are actually looking to do a transaction around the same time. We're hoping to get something done by the end of the year. But this has been done throughout the country uh, previously under um, mostly for gas purchase contracts. There's been about 80 billion of these transactions done to date. Um, for our purposes, really, uh, what's happened in the last only in the last few years has the this market been able to use this transaction for renewables. So that's a, a recent development. And also, as far as NIPE is concerned, you know, this is the first. Uh, these are the first back-to-back -back PPAs we have entered into on behalf of our customers for uh, solar projects. So this is our first opportunity to utilize this type of uh, structure and this type of uh, transaction to deliver savings uh, to our customers. So they're very excited about it. And the creation of this entity, I believe, will have future util you know, utility for us and our customers for future projects to enable more renewables to be built. So we see this as a, as a real plus and a differentiator for NIPA in terms of providing a benefit to these projects that only we can provide because in order to do this, you must be a, a municipal tax exempt utility. So here it's, if not, but for us, the savings would not be achieved. Uh, but we do want to recognize the assistance we're getting from the Empire State Development Corp, who has set up this entity uh, in, in order to enable these transactions. So uh, that is what's before the board to enable and to recommend and approve the assignment of our existing contracts to this new entity. Uh, and, and if there's any maybe, questions, be happy to entertain. Yeah, let's, uh, let's just uh, spend a couple minutes on the why this structure, why now? Why not sooner? Um, give us some bigger picture uh, context here. So you said um, changes have been made to accommodate renewables. Did I hear that uh, correctly? Well, 80 billion of uh, you know, funding has been provided uh, across the country over the last however many years. Renewables can now just be accommodated or the market's receptive. Expand on that a little bit to why renewables uh, can now step into this space. Sure, it just it just hadn't been as a developed um, product in the market that they've been able to accept uh, in terms of how many of these were available or being done, and to um, do it in the same way as just outright purchasing gas, uh, which which had been allowed um, previously for the last twenty years. Uh, so, only I think the first one uh, using solar was only done in twenty twenty. So, uh, and we've only been, you know, involved in these contracts probably since 2021 with our customers. So we've really, we've never really had an opportunity to utilize this um, prior to that. And, uh, you know, either the market wasn't there or we hadn't had the opportunity where our customers were um, entering into back-to-back -back PPAs with us for, a renewable project. So it sort of came together somewhat at the right time for us to take advantage of, of this opportunity uh, and be able to, you know, make it uh, work for the benefit of our customers. So I think uh, it's really a function of the market evolving and in a time in which uh, it came together with our need to do it on behalf of our customers. And clarify, you know, your, your terms, you say the market's evolving or the market wasn't there. Um, why is the market there now? You know, clarify, educate uh, us and others a little bit. What's changed in the market? Why is the market now receptive? Why are investors now wanting and willing? I mean, expand on that a little bit. I, I think it's just a, a function of uh, seeing how solar projects either have been developed, how they are actually 
working in terms of their capacity, uh, reliability, and I think they needed to see how they performed over some period of time to be able to develop, uh, you know, a, a modeling around it to make it more predictable and be able to uh, fit it into a structure like this versus something like, you know, just purchasing gas at a price. So the you know solar industry has been evolving um, over the last number of years. And uh, now I think there's enough comfort with it that they can make these type of uh, predictions, you know, projections and, and modeling around it with a lot of predictability. So I think it's a, been a, a comfort level and acceptance um, that has really, you know, come to be, as I mentioned, only since uh, 19, uh, since 2020. So only in the last four years has there uh, been an appetite for this in the, in the marketplace. And how does it change, uh, if at all, the, the risk uh, that we're assuming or not? Well, what's, what's in it for us? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't change our, our risk at all, uh, nor does it change the risk of our, our customers. It, um, it just provides this, a, a level of savings that they would not otherwise have. Um, we continue to facilitate these projects as part of our DER advisory group. Um, we, we do get fees for doing these projects to compensate us for the work that we're doing. Uh, but outside of that, it's really about enabling um, our customers to see execution in these projects. The other fact is that, uh, you know, why now? Uh, in, in order to do these projects, you really have to have a certain size or critical mass to uh, be able to put it into the market to generate that type of savings. So with New York City, for example, we have 51 different solar installations with each of those having their own power purchase agreement we're able to bundle all of those to get to that critical mass, as well as add in some of their own market purchases. And in the case of the Port Authority, they would not have been able to do it on their own as a standalone because they, they wouldn't have had the that critical mass or size. So we've been able to um, roll them into this project so they could take advantage of it as well for their uh, JFK solar project, which is one of the largest solar projects in the city and is a uh, community solar project. So that project will also provide bill credits for residents in the area. So it's a, it's a terrific project. And, uh, but all of these projects have gotten more expensive since the pandemic with supply chain issues, inflation, uh, higher interest costs. So all of these have got, the economics have gotten uh, worse for these projects by now putting it into this type of transaction and providing this level of savings, you know, we can uh, eat away at some of those cost increases and make it more affordable and economical, um, you know, for our customers and for uh, residents as well. So uh, I think it really works all around. And again, it's, I think it's a good model for us to be able to leverage off into the future, to be able to do more things like this. And, as listening to you and you know again as you know this i'm assuming it must make projects viable that wouldn't have otherwise been viable or makes broad projects um you know all the more beneficial um that were otherwise at the margin yeah absolutely i mean i think this is a again a, a differentiator that we where we can come in and provide a benefit that nobody else can so it, it kind of it speaks to the issue of nipa coming in and helping to make a lot of renewable projects in the state happen that might otherwise not, that might be on the edge or on the bubble. And these are good examples of, of that. When we take all of the savings we're generating for the city, for example, even though these projects, uh, it generates a 10% savings, when we do it, add in the market purchases that we're also putting into it and take those savings and apply it to the project, now you're talking about a 30% savings off of the price that they would otherwise have to pay, which is significantly higher already than just regular market prices. So uh, the cost of um, entering into renewable projects has only gotten higher. So having a vehicle like this, having tools like this that can help make it uh, somewhat cheaper, uh, brings it back and makes it you know, more viable, competitive, and more can actually get done. Okay. 
So investors, uh, you've, you've got you know, bundled, you're able to pull together, aggregate a lot of projects that diversify the risk. Um, renewables, more reliable, more dependable. Um, we're able to function in that facilitator enabler uh, role. Uh, so it's really a win-win-win here. Uh, when there's win-win-win, it's like somebody must be losing. But in this case, uh, that doesn't appear the case to be the case. The market's finally accepted and recognized uh, renewables. Their risk been diversified with the aggregation of projects. So uh, literally, it's all upside at this point. Yeah, I think that's correct. Okay. Other questions for uh, Adam? I know the structure sounds uh, a little wonky or different. Uh, the good news is we're replicating what's been proven for years elsewhere. It's now relevant for us. Kudos to uh, Adam uh, and the team for uh, helping us, uh, you know, step into this and you know play a leadership role. Everybody okay? Absolutely. Appreciate the creativity, and um, I think it's important to just remind ourselves that these structures are being used successfully by others, and now it's our turn to advantage ourselves. Yeah, right time, right place to do so, B. Agree. Okay, Adam. Uh, sure. Energy, next uh, next item is... Holding score. Yep. Right, so along the same theme here, right, creating more tools in the toolbox to enable us to maximize the amount of renewables that we can uh, make happen. Uh, we're also asking for approval to um, create a subsidiary holding corporation that will uh, enhance our ability to do more projects. Um, this was a, a provision of the expanded authority that uh, we were granted by the legislature and the governor. Um, we did have conversations with them about uh, the ability to do this and how this would enhance um, our ability to get projects done. And what it does is allows us to set up what I would call project finance type structures that the industry typically uses uh, today to get projects done. And that may, will enable us to not only do projects on our own, but partner with others, which would enable us to leverage our dollars to make more renewable projects happen where we bring our, you know, our set of values to the table uh, along with the private entities. Um, issues we've had sometimes in terms of doing joint projects, um, we'd have to own a discrete type of asset uh, in this structure and in the legislation, we're able to do uh, true partnerships on solar type projects that um, you know, will allow us to take a, the 51% that we're required to do under the legislation. So having this um, entity set up and its ability to uh, create uh, project companies uh, will enable more projects to happen and expand our ability. Uh, we expect that this would be included in our strategic plan that we're putting together uh, that we have to deliver by the end of the year so that uh, we'll, we'll outline um, another way in which we believe we will be able to approach projects and get uh, make those happen. So it's another, it's another way of um, creating that maximum flexibility uh, that we talk about in order to leverage our resources to maximize the amount of projects we can actually get done for the state. Um, another tool in the toolbox as has been referenced by some board members and others, correct? I mean, it's just an, another another opportunity for us, as I like to say, to uh, uh, you know, lean into our leadership role and, uh, and better enable us to deliver the types of results and outcomes uh, that are expected of us and that we otherwise uh, intend to deliver, right? Gives us more flexibility. Absolutely. And we're also pre approving the re release of money to uh, seed this entity uh, for $100 million that will provide it with the equity needed to invest into projects as soon as we have gone through this strategic uh, plan approval process. 
um, that we are putting together. So this is just, you know, putting all the pieces together and positioning ourselves uh, so that uh, as soon as we are have an approved uh, strategic plan uh, by the board, we can act quickly, decisively, and maximize uh, the amount of projects we can execute on. And we'll continue to work through some of the specifics, governance and others uh, over the next couple of months as this gets set up. But uh, this allows us to you know, start down that path in a meaningful and productive way. Yep, that's correct. Okay. And just for just for good order's sake, uh, so we're approving the creation of the subsidiary, the release of the equity funding, and we're also authorizing a shared service agreement between NIPA and the subsidiary so that we make sure that uh, everything is arm's length and that they're paying uh, their fair share of the costs that NIPA is providing um, in various uh, shared services, support services. So um, this services agreement will address, you know, sort of all those issues. And this helps uh, maintain the separateness of this entity because uh, we're trying to make sure that these activities are all somewhat ring fenced from the NIPA, um, you know, parent entity and has no recourse back to NIPA. And at the same time that they're paying for their uh, pro rata share of costs so that, again, some of our rate payers uh, won't claim that we're uh, having them pay uh, for something else like this, that it's all being done at arm's length uh, distance. So, uh, again, just another uh, item to be approved here. If I could, uh, so so yeah, go ahead, I want to make I want to make sure I understand the we're moving toward the formation of this entity, and the details or the specifics are TBD. We don't have the actual um, terms and conditions, bylaws, all of that. We're just what you're asking us to approve is that we create this entity, but I think um, the chair said the specifics are, are gonna follow, but I just wanna make sure we're clear that what you're asking us to do is um, start the formation of this entity, but we will be looking at what the specific terms and conditions are. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. We, we'll be coming back to you to talk about, you know, uh, appointment of uh, board members to this entity. It needs to be, uh, the majority of uh, the board members need to be deemed independent um under the statute and um you know they'll adopt the bylaws and there'll be um, a lot of discussion about you know what kind of projects they'll take on and what kind of um reporting uh, back to the board on progress and cadence of that um so all, all those things we will be coming back to you with this will at least uh once approved at the full board meeting will allow us to, you know, open bank accounts and set up all the di different things we need to do to be set up so that as soon as the strategic plan is approved, uh, we can actually execute transactions. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a, a setup stage here just to build on that. I mean, you're not running off to spend $100 million uh, next week or next month, correct? That's correct. So, I mean, I think that's part of where we're all coming from is we're, we're authorizing and enabling the framework and the beginnings of, of the initiative. And you'll just continue to fill, fill in the blanks and the, and the spaces with, with us over the coming weeks, right? Yep, that, that's correct. Um, but you know, it's really, you know, putting that framework together and putting all the pieces in right. place yeah. so that we will be ready to go once we get the... Uh, Correct. All the details approved by the board. Correct. Uh, Laurie, you got a question? Yeah, thank you. Just building off of, um, you know, what Judge Morris had said. So it is, it's kind of like we're, we're preparing, right? So this is in place as we're getting ready with the strategic plan. And then that, again, is like a tool in the toolbox once we're ready and looking at projects. There is some structure with the reporting requirements, though, in the law, correct? Like, I think it said there has to be at least two reports um, under, you know, the new authority in the law. But then once that board is set up, they potentially could do, you know, more. 
Yes, that's correct. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to hit on the the reporting a little bit to make sure I understood. I mean, this this entity will be separate from us, right, Adam? Yes. It's not a it's not a subsidiary. Well, I mean, it it is a subsidiary, but it is, um, and it, you know, it has its own. It'll have its own board members, which we'll talk about how to uh, appoint those. We expect obviously Justin to be on that yeah. board, but. Uh, a number of other uh, others well, would well, have to be on that are deemed independent. Right. Well, we're, we're going to work our way through some of that. Okay. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure we don't have cart for the horse here. Um, just as as a group, you know, that we have collect progressive comfort level with with how we're doing what we're doing. Um, so I think that's just the nature of the questions and the, and the interaction. Um, yeah, I mean, the, it's, it's very clear question? to everybody that that we can't we we can't take any. Just so it's clear to everybody, you know, the current law does not allow us to enter into any agreements or contracts, you know, for the actual renewables um, projects per se until uh, the strategic plan has been submitted to the board and they've approved the plan. So you know that is uh, required before anything can get done. And as you said, it's really. Um, you know, setting the table, oh, um, table putting set. pieces in yeah. place so that when we will be ready, once there is an approval to move forward um, on projects, how we describe them and what the parameters are in which we'll do them. And as well as having the um, the feedback and the reporting requirements to keep make sure that uh, you as a board are constantly kept informed as to the progress of what we're doing um, with these subsidiaries and these projects. So. Um, there'll be all of that kind of uh, reporting transparency as we move forward. B? Just for clarity's sake, we're talking about two different uh, entities. Um, one has NIPA in the title and one does not. So I think it's just really important that we continue to clarify what each of these does and how they relate to each other. Um, and how they relate to us, because it, the fact, it's just, I just want to continue to clarify in my mind what these two structures will do for us and for our customers. We'll, we'll make sure to um, continue to make that distinction as we come back to you with further projects down the road to make sure that it's clear what entity is, is being utilized uh, in a particular transaction. I think, you know, be in, um, at the risk of uh, misstating something, I kind of equate it to you know, when you're playing at a level of sophistication that we're now playing, um, organizations will form limited purpose or special purpose uh, entities. And that's, you know, what we have here that enables us to deliver outcomes um, that where we've uh, isolated uh, and not taken on undue risk for the parent company in terms of uh, NIPA. So this is a, a, an entity that will enable us uh, to deliver incremental outcomes. Um, entities that, um, as we just discussed with the power, with the prepay uh, agreements and power purchase agreements, enable us to be more creative and more flexible uh, in what we're doing in response to uh, the demands and expectations uh, that are on us to lead uh, the path forward or lead down the path forward for a broader based, uh, you know, renewable driven uh, outcome. So, um, yeah, the complexities, uh, you, you're right, we need to understand in terms of the governance structure, but uh, I don't look at them as atypical or unusual in terms of uh, the, the, the level of, of game and field that we're now playing in. Okay. I don't know, Justin, Justin. Chairman, but I think it's that um, I'm really hoping that through this process, we educate our consumers and our customers and the public. And that's why I'm asking these questions and kind of forcing us yeah. to see these things over and over. No, I, and I appreciate that. And uh, clearly want to be transparent and offer as much clarity. Want to ensure um, people understand it's uh, more about the why than, than the how. And uh, hopefully, you know, we've uh, 
uh, earn the trust uh, of our constituents uh, that we can get to help uh, you know us in the state and them get to a better outcome and we bring intellectual capital um, that they expect of us to, to deliver on that. So uh, as Lori said, others have said earlier, additional tools in the toolbox. We need a much more sophisticated toolbox as we go uh, forward and couldn't agree more, want to educate and inform uh, as best we can. Any other questions? Just a, just a comment, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, what I find attractive about the use of these subsidiaries, uh, these special purpose subsidiaries, is that it's fully contemplated under 27A in our expanded authority. So I, 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 this, is, this is consistent and flows out of the theme of maximizing the renewable energy build out for the state of New York, our citizens, our stakeholders, et cetera. So I, I actually uh, uh, am in full agreement with, with this approach. And this approach strikes me as very uh, uh, smart and innovative uh, for us to maximize that expanded renewable authority given to us by the governor and the legislature. Yeah, well said. We're just leaning into it um, and ensuring we're re ready to rock uh, when the uh, opportunity presents itself uh, uh, to start the year. Okay. Adam, uh, last item for you. Sure. And uh... Uh, this is a uh, approval for for NIPA to uh, issue general resolution uh, we're calling series 24 2024 uh, green bonds uh, to finance the projects in the NIPA's capital plan. These are the basic you know regular projects we have going on to maintain our assets in state of good repair and um, for both uh, generation related transmission headquarters all of those uh, categories. And um, what I would uh, like to note about it is a, a few things. One is that um, in the process of um, putting this together, uh, we were upgraded by two of the rating agencies, uh, KBRA and Moody's uh, to from AA to AA plus. And um, so we're very, we're very proud of that uh, and that we got that recognition uh, and also to point out that the rating agencies in our conversations with them do raise some questions and concerns about all of these different um, things that NIPE is being asked to take on and how will we do it. And when we describe to them our approach, whether it be having used the SFP or doing the prepaid with ESDC or our intent to create uh, this subsidiary to enable the renewables, uh, they've you know, applauded that effort and recognized that in uh, as part of their upgrade opinion because it's allowing them to identify all the different debt that's being issued with the particular projects that are being undertaken rather than it all being in one place and not being able to figure out what goes where and what's happening and is this too much debt for the authority and uh, competing interests and, and all of those other questions. So they they do like this whole approach of, as we will call it, you know, the sum of the parts being, uh, you know, greater than the whole. Um, so that, that was something that they did cite just as, a, as an aside, but I will send around the complete ratings reports once these are finalized, because I think it's also very good uh, for everybody to read to understand how they're viewing the authority from, from their lens. But all of it, even with the other agencies that just affirmed where we were at AA, which is very good, um, all have very positive comments about our plans and our approach. So I think that was uh, uh, very positive. And they like the fact that you know we're very transparent, uh, looking to issue green bonds. They like the integrated report and the information they see there. So all those things were, uh, were recognized in their, in their reporting. Uh, our, our plan is really has been to get approval uh, today and to be able to um, start marketing the bonds and be able to uh, you know, price it as soon as we 
believe it's uh, best to do. So we're looking for maximum flexibility uh, so that we're not locked into or locked out of any period of time in which we can uh, market and sell uh, the bonds. So that's why we are looking for both the approval at the finance committee today, as well as uh, for the full board. Are there any questions on the bond issuance? Yeah, we've talked we've talked about this uh at least at last board meeting and if not before and otherwise in finance committee meeting so the good news is uh the anticipated timeline game plan is uh coming uh to fruition uh and just to add my two cents in the spirit of transparency here um relative to the timeline so our game plan had been to do what we're doing, which is advance this uh, through finance committee here, have it approved at the full board meeting, which was originally scheduled in 10 days. Due to some calendar conflicts, the full board meeting got bumped into October, and uh, that would have uh, potentially compromised the window of opportunity we have to execute on this transaction. So we opted to take advantage of all of us being together today, not just as a finance committee, but to then convene as a full board and do today what we otherwise would have done in uh, 10 days as previously uh, scheduled. So uh, there's no acceleration per se. This is just to ensure we maintain the pace and rhythm that we anticipated so that we can uh, optimize uh, the window of opportunity and the execution on the transaction uh, as we uh, proceed over the next uh, several weeks. So special board meeting has a potentially uh, a potential connotation that uh, might raise some question or concern. There's nothing special about what we're doing. This is just ensuring we can maintain the, the pace and rhythm that uh, we had planned for. So uh, hopefully that's responsive to any questions uh, you or others have about that. Otherwise, as I said, this has been a topic and uh, an initiative that's uh, been advanced. Kudos to Adam and the team for the great work and uh, the fact that the market's responding well to us and recognizing the strength and quality of the organization, balance sheet operations, level of discipline. So always great to have our rating agencies uh, you know, help us. And that can uh, only uh, bear fruit uh, as we go forward uh, near term and longer term as well. Uh, with all of that, any other questions uh, for Adam on this? If I could then, um, I'd ask for a motion um, for all four items. Adam gave us the financial report, but support of the release of funds for the Canal Corporation, uh, the assignment and uh, enter into prepayment agreements you know, on, that uh, were discussed and presented, uh, approve the incorporation of the Renewable Energy Development Holdings Corporation, as well as uh, the issuance of uh, the green bonds as uh, just discussed. I could have one collective uh, motion to address all those if that works for everyone. I so move, so move, John. Thank you, Dennis. Second. Second. Thank you, Cecily. Um, unless there's any other questions, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, motion carried. Thank you very much for the time and uh, good discussion on uh, all four or five of those uh, topics. Adam, thank you for the presentation and more importantly, uh, the good work to get us here. And uh, we look forward to uh, some great execution on the bond offering. All right. Uh, thank you. I'll definitely up. keep you up to date. And Next Karen, up. For, Karen, for the meeting notes, I think that second came from B because oh, my did. mic was muted. Oh, it was B. <laughs> Just want to make sure the notes Cecil. reflect it. That was B doing my Laura imitation or Cecil imitation. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, Apologies. It's the upstate accent. <laughs> Got it. Yes. <laughs> must be. All right. Uh, Next up, uh, Lori, uh, who's uh, running point on uh, our office building in uh, White Plains and the ongoing evolution relative to uh, th that uh, development, literally and figuratively. 
Thanks, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Chair and trustees and NIPA staff. So as the Chair uh, stated, I am here to talk about and present an item on the White Plains building facilities. So I have two requests from the committee this morning. One is for authorization to enter into a binding development agreement with the real estate developer, Hamilton Green. And the second is to authorize an initial expenditure of $50 million associated with the project to carry us through to the end of the year. So as you may recall, because we've had a couple of conversations about this, back in August of 2023, the Power Authority issued an RFP and we sought to engage the real estate development community on two separate ideas. One was for a new office location for the Power Authority in the White Plains area. And the second was to locate a potential purchaser for the existing building. So presently, I'm only asking to move forward on the first item, which is a new office location for the Power Authority. So as I stated, right, the RFP was issued in August of 2023. We received three responses back in November of 2023. We assembled an internal team to review the responses and engage the uh, developers in interviews to get some more information about their proposals. The team um, decided that one of the proposals was out of scope for the RFP, so we only proceeded with the two developers. I came back before the board earlier this year and asked for authorization to move forward with more pointed negotiations with the two real estate developers that were moving to the next phase of the negotiation. So that resulted in um, the Power Authority entering into a non-binding letter of intent back in May with Hamilton Green, the real estate developer. And then we recently <clears throat> just entered into a non-binding term sheet in August with Hamilton Green. So now, in order to keep the momentum moving forward, I'm here to ask for authorization to move into negotiations for a binding development agreement with Hamilton Green for a purpose-built building um, for the Power Authority in the White Plains area. So the development agreement that I'm asking authorization to start negotiations will contain detailed project description of the purpose-built building for the Power Authority. It'll contain a plan scope of work, and it'll also contain a schedule and, and identify critical milestones and other terms and conditions, all for the benefit and protection of the Power Authority. So we are very excited to be at this point. It has been a long road, and we there have been a lot of people in the Power Authority involved in this project. There is still a lot of work left to be done, um, but we're very excited about the prospect of having a new building located in the downtown White Plains area. And we think it helps us, you know, move into the future. We're all talking about the future and, and you know, what it's going to be in our role in the future. Um, and this building will represent an, our commitment to clean energy and, uh, and it basically stand behind our values. So it's obvious, but I'm going to just highlight a couple of benefits of the new building. Uh, one is that it's going to be built to suit our needs, right? We will work with Hamilton Green, the real estate developer, and basically design it to suit our needs. This building is in excess of 400,000 square feet. The new building will be smaller. It'll be 300,000 square feet, but that still allows us to grow as far as employee counts and have the building still better suit our needs. Um, the new building will be lead gold. It will be 100% electric, which is great. Um, it will include sustainable energy efficient options like view glass, which is a smart technology for the shell of the building. It will also have solar panels on the roof and it will have geothermal power. It will also, and this is very important to everybody who works in this building, it will also have parking underground um, and it will also be able to service our growing electric fleet. Another benefit of entering into this agreement with Hamilton Green is that we made a commitment to White Plains that we wanted to stay in the White Plains downtown area. And this allows us to stand behind that commitment and to be part of its revitalization. And we think that that's very important. So in order to continue moving forward, to go back to my first ask, I'm asking for the board to authorize us to start negotiations with Hamilton Green for binding development agreement and to authorize the expenditure of $50 million in initial capital and that is to um, in two buckets. One is $30 million because we need to purchase, once the development agreement has been negotiated, 
we need to purchase the pad or the air rights where our new building will sit. And then there's another $20 million that basically we anticipate needing to carry us through to the end of the year. And that could be for direct or indirect costs or down payments for materials or equipment. So in order to make sure that we can stay on pace with the project, we're asking for the authorization for expenditures at this point in time. Um, and that is my ask of the committee this morning. And if you have any questions, I am happy to answer them. All right. Um, so we're, can I unbundle the two asks, uh, Lori? I mean, Hamilton Green, you're going to negotiate. And on a parallel path, you're looking to spend 50 mil, upwards of 50 million to acquire property rights and take other steps. Uh, worst case scenario, you don't reach a successful conclusion with Hamilton Green. And we need to pivot. Uh, we haven't gotten ahead of ourselves with uh, uh, any expenditure of the 50 million. I mean, that's how that's I'm correct. thinking about um, unbundling these two. Is that right? That's correct, Chair. Yes. Okay. So give us a quick refresher on Hamilton Green. So Hamilton Green is, um, is a developer in White Plains and it's RXR and Luke Capelli, but they are currently developing the um, condominium complex and the residential rental buildings, which are across the street from our building currently, where the White Plains Mall used to sit. They've also done several developments, one by the train station in White Plains, and they've done developments in um, in other parts of Westchester County in Rochelle, and they have other buildings in White Plains. Um, so they are very familiar with, with White Plains. They're uh, an established developer. They have, a, they have a good track record. That was part of the due diligence that the team um, underwent when deciding to move forward with Hamilton Green. Okay. But they, they know Westchester, they know White Plains, they know us. We have been speaking with them on a regular basis. Um, they understand our needs and we are continuing to collaborate with them on the building. And refresh my memory as to what the, the best case or anticipated timeline would be uh, in terms of negotiating the agreement and starting construction, completing construction when we would ideally be in the building, what's our bigger picture timeline here? So the bigger picture timeline is, uh, and it's a fairly aggressive schedule, but we believe we can be on pace with it because we are meeting on a regular basis. We, you know, we have the teams meet on a weekly basis and we spend, you know, two to three hours going through um, details with regard to the building. But we um, hope to negotiate the development agreement by November of this year. Um, which is why we're looking for the additional 20 million in case we need it to carry us through to the end of the year. And we anticipate being able to move into the building in June of 2027. 27, so we're three years out. Okay. We're a little less than three years out. By the time we get to the development agreement, it'll be like closer to two and a half, we believe. Uh, and the site is, is that developer dependent? We, we're, we're that, well, if, on if we, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, Chair. No, go ahead. I was going to say the, the site is right now they have site plan approval for, I believe, four residential rental buildings. Um, so we have, if this negotiation is successful and we have a development agreement, then one of those buildings obviously will be converted into an office building for us. Okay. So they control the, the site now. Yes, they do. Okay. Questions, thoughts. I guess it's fair comments. to say much of the much of the initial work is 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 underway on the site. So they're they're digging uh, where where the future potential garage would be. There's already you know plenty of construction work going on as they develop the other three buildings on the site currently. So two of them are already top topped off. They are. Right? It, yep. It's a very active site. Um, when you visit the White Plains uh, office building, you can see right. it's very active. Two of the buildings are done. They are building a, a loading dock for the condo complex. And they have said that once we come to an agreement that they will shift their priorities to our office building. Okay. And what's, po what's positive, Lori, is that it sounds like they have all the requisite White Plains approvals because they're they're digging dirt now, right? So they have their approvals to to move forward once we come to an agreement in the next 60, 90 days. 
That's correct. They are going to go to the White Plains um, building department just to get site plan approval for an office building as opposed to residential rental. But mm -hmm. uh, we understand that that should not be an obstacle, but they are ready to go. They have the labor on site. They have the equipment on site so they can mobilize very quickly. And I assume they have a very good relationship, Lori, with uh, because they they are they already have topped off two buildings that they have a very good relationship with White Plains, right? That that's that's yes, another they, positive. Yes, they do. They do. They they work with White Plains often. Uh, they enjoy working with them, and and the city of White Plains is also very excited about the fact that we are potentially moving next door. And we see this as a benefit to our recruiting efforts too, in terms of recruiting the workforce of the future and, and what might what makes for an attractive workplace to get people uh, into the office and and uh, functioning at a high level. And we think this will contribute to, to, to that as well. Lori, thank you. From Lori to Lori, um, the geothermal aspect is obviously a, a very exciting and, and big deal. Can you talk a little bit about that more? And are the other buildings looking in the, the four to also do geothermal, if you're aware? So I'm not sure if the other buildings are looking to do geothermal. And that's something that we clearly, you know, put a priority on um, early on and, and need to get resolved, obviously, before they start construction of the building. But um, we did want to maximize the amount of geothermal holes so that we could power the building and have it be 100% electric. So we're very excited about that as well. Um, so it's to be continued and they're doing the investigation now, but um, it should power um, most of the building. Thank you. Uh -huh. And in terms of the overall scope of the project, cost of the project, that's all TBD uh, in terms of your negotiations. That's correct. And by the time we um, finish negotiations with the development agreement, you know, we'll have the GMP for the core and shell, and it's really just the internal fit out. And that's something that we're working on now, but it's all TBD. And clearly we'll, we will be reporting back to the board, you know, as this project progresses. Okay. All right. Uh, so two items uh, there. One uh, to uh, negotiate and uh, the development agreement. Two uh, to uh, begin to uh, lean into the cost of, uh, of that development, uh, not to exceed at least initially the fifty million dollars. Unless there's other questions or discussion, I ask for a motion uh, to uh, recommend approval of those two items to the full board uh, in a couple of weeks. Don't move. Second. Thanks, Dennis. That was a second from either Cecily or Lori or B. I'm not sure who was doing that. <laughs> I think it was Lori W. Lori, yes. okay. Karen's got Thank it. Thank you. I'm sure. All right. Any other questions? Otherwise, all in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion uh, carried. All right, thanks very much, Lori. Uh, workforce development, a lot of good stuff happening there. Uh, a lot you're of good for stuff. Some additional dollars. I I am. Thank you. A lot of good stuff happening there. So in May, the board approved funding, right, of two million dollars for us for the Power Authority to issue an RFP. It was our first RFP for workforce workforce training initiatives, and this is part of the expanded authority and our commitment to spend up to twenty five million dollars annually in collaboration and partnership with the Department of Labor to create jobs in the clean energy field. So in July, we issued the RFP. Um, it was the first time we dipped our toe in the water and we got 18 responses, which we were very happy about. We thought that was a great and a robust uh, response. Um, so I am asking for, again, two things from the committee this morning. One is to approve a contracts moving forward with seven of the vendors. Um, and the other is to recommend additional funding of $550,000. So the board approved funding of $2 million, but in order to move forward with the seven vendors and their asks for funding, we need an additional $550,000 to raise the aggregate to $2.55 million. Um, as I said, we had a great response. There were 18 vendors that 
uh, responded to the RFP. So I'm going to call this the first tranche of funding with regard to this RFP. And once we finalize negotiations th with the remaining vendors, I anticipate coming back to you later on uh, this year, asking for a second tranche of funding, which I anticipate to be um, north of $2 million. Um, but until those negotiations have been finalized, I, I can't give you an exact amount. But um, you will be seeing me again, and I will be asking you for more money. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of information about the seven vendors that we have completed negotiations with, and we would like to move forward. Um, and they all present different options for training, employment opportunities, apprenticeship opportunities, and they're located you know, throughout the state. So, so we have diversity in location. We have diversity in, in offerings. So the first is the iTech Training and Education Center. So iTech is a standalone facility and it's located in Rochester, New York, and it's been around for about 15 years and they focus on serving priority populations and they offer coursework um, at no cost to the participants, which is great. So they've gotten rid of one of the um, barriers to entry. So iTech has partnered with the Golisano Foundation and they offer classes in the construction trade, framing, roofing, plumbing, and HVAC. So what iTech wants to do is they're seeking $114,000 from the Power Authority, and they want to include a two-week course to over 100 individuals at the conclusion of the construction trade course to provide participants with working knowledge on the theory and the practical installation of refrigerants and heat pump installations. The uh, individuals who complete this additional two-week course will also receive a marketable certification in refrigerants to assist them in finding employment opportunities. The next vendor is the New York City District Council Carpenters Training Center, or CTC, because it's a very long name. So the CTC has been around for more than 50 years, and it's requesting $182,000 from the Power Authority. And the funds will basically support the training of 150 active apprentices in the construction trade. And this money will allow the council to have the apprentices over the two-year apprenticeship program spend four weeks focusing on specific skills necessary to work in the energy efficiency and clean technology projects and building performance. Then we have the Resilience Education Training and Innovation Center, or READY. So the READY Center was founded in 2016 and it was founded in response to Superstorm Sandy and it's dedicated to climate resilience. It's based in Brooklyn and it is seeking $432,000 from the Power Authority to support the expansion of its energy storage training initiative. Courses will include fire safety training to prepare graduates to be certificate of fitness holders through the FDNY for energy storage projects. The training also will include modules on designing, permitting and operating battery systems and it will benefit both workers just coming into the workforce, as well as workers already in the workforce that need to be upskilled or reskilled. So last year, the Ready Center received a grant from Con Ed in the amount of $500,000 for a three-year program to support a holistic green energy training program. And the funding from NIPA will help contribute to the cost of that program to ensure that the Ready Center can meet its training graduation and job placement goals for 2025. So the money will be used to allow four cohorts of 60 participants to receive EV and battery storage training, retention and supportive services or wraparound services, paid internships and job placement for up to 12 months in the green energy sector. The next vendor is Soulful Synergies and its workforce training initiative. So this is a minority owned workforce development agency and is dedicated to creating equitable and sustainable communities and is requesting $857,000. Since 2013, it has operated recruitment and training programs and has trained more than 8,000 community members and provided them with certifications and hands-on training to provide sustainable career pathways for its graduates. So the funds are needed by Soulful Synergy to expand their program. They need to purchase equipment, they need to hire additional instructors because they want to ensure that they have the appropriate student to instructor ratio the hands-on training experience that they provide. They will train 80 participants, 40 in weatherization, and 40 in electrification. Each course is 130 hours in length, which is you know, a lot of time. And plus they have an additional 18 hours of career readiness workshops. 
And each student will also work with a specific case manager and a career specialist for wraparound services and job placement. This program in particular has more contact hours between the participants and the case managers and wraparound services. The participants will also receive recognized certifications and OSHA, OSHA sorry, site safety training program cards. Then we have St. Nick's Alliance Workforce Training Initiative. This is a 50-year-old community-based organization that focuses its efforts on transforming the lives of residents in disadvantaged communities through education, housing, and employment. They are seeking $325,000 to support a seven-week, 200-hour, credentialed, employer-linked HVAC training program that combines classroom and hands-on training in high-efficiency HVAC technology, which includes heat pumps. The participants will also receive training in the green construction skills, green building operations, and green building maintenance. The funding will allow 50 individuals in three separate cohorts of 15 to 20 students to receive training in the clean energy field. Then we have the United Way of Long Island Workforce Training Initiative, and this is a 501c3 organization. It was established 60 years ago, and it's requesting $253,000 to support its green construction energy efficiency technician training program. This program will prepare 50 participants to perform comprehensive whole home assessments to identify problems and prescribe prioritized solutions based upon building science. So this training program focuses on priority populations, people who have been denied opportunities or education in the past and prepare them for careers in the clean energy field to allow them to earn a family sustaining wage. Graduates of the program will work closely with homeowners and building owners to design plans for homes to be energy efficient and to ensure the durability and structure of the home while also protecting the health and safety of the inhabitants. And the last vendor we wanna move forward with is the Urban Green Council Workforce Training Initiative. This is also a 501c3 organization whose mission is to decarbonize buildings for healthy and resilient communities. They have been around for 22 years and they are seeking $387,000 to support green professional training programs to a targeted group of individuals who work in partnership with Solar One and the US Green Building Council of Long Island. So this training is in response to the critical need to upskill and reskill the traditional workforce and to prepare them to implement energy efficiency strategies. It will also uplift green building career pathways for new workers from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds. So they are also focusing on the already in the utility field, as well as those who are just entering the workforce. So those are the seven vendors that we have um, negotiated contracts with, and we're very excited about the effect we can have and the impact we're going to have on communities throughout New York State. So I'm seeking your authorization to move forward with those seven vendors, um, ask for additional funding. And again, uh, you will be seeing me looking and asking for more money later in the year. <laughs> and I'm happy to take any questions. It was a lot to, uh, to go through, and I understand that with the seven vendors, but, um, but I think it's great. I think it's a great first you know, shot out of the box for us, and, um, and I think it's going to make a, a great impact. Sorry, so, so, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Come on, Ryan, Lois. Uh, I was just going to say, Lori, what's so positive and powerful is that each of these organizations are at the local neighborhood and community level. That, that, that is powerful and positive. I, I agree. I think it's, you know, it's something very new for us, but we feel very good about the impact we anticipate having throughout New York State on a very local level. So in, in terms of these seven, Laurie, um, is this two and a half million, that's what they asked for or that's what we're giving them? Are we funding them at 100% of the ask? Uh, or, or Give me some bigger picture numbers here. Sure. Some we are funding at 100% of the ask and others, um, when we looked at their submittals and we interviewed them, um, we asked them to cut down their ask because some of it fell outside the scope of the RFP. So some is a partial funding and others are a full funding. Are there any, any of these here, could they do more if we gave them more? 
Uh, Chair, I am sure that they could all do more if we gave them more. Um, and we and we can always consider that. When I when I appeared before the board in May and the board authorized the Department of Labor to also issue an RFP, and that was in the amount of $5 million. So mm-hmm. we are also working because we have more negotiations to do with the remaining vendors. We're also coordinating our efforts with the Department of Labor to see if any of these vendors also you know, have or will respond to the Department of Labor RFP so we can, you know, coordinate the grant funding. But, you know, we will have uh, constant touch points, I'm going to say, you know, with these vendors. And, you know, we already have contracts with the two entities that we have given grants to. So if we, you know, have a conversation with them and they can and they can persuade us that they need additional funding, then uh, we will not hesitate to come back before this board and ask for additional funds. And, and like I said, I do anticipate asking for more money towards the end of this year. Um, but if they if they need more funds and they can demonstrate they have a track record of success, um, then we will not hesitate to come back and ask the board for additional funds. And just for purposes of context here, this is part of the up to $25 million that was part of the um, expanded authority last year in the uh, NIPA renewables legislation. So, and this is our first year at it. So we're just becoming known in this space and a lot of great work is being done by the team. But I, I expect that as people start to see announcements of these awards, we're going to get more interest yep. and, and more more requests for participation in the, in in this fund. Yes. Yeah. And the, the Department of Labor, because they are a known entity in this field, you know, they helped us advertise the RFP. Our communications team internally did a great job putting, you know, social media posts out regarding the RFP. So the word has definitely gotten out, um, which is why we got so many responses and um, and people were asking for so much money. But they, you know, they have definite plans. They know where the need is. Uh, we're trying to fill that need and fill the gap and, and make an impact. And I, I don't ask it to be other than incredibly supportive, incrementally supportive of the initiative. Um, I mean, I'm in the camp of uh, if they can deliver good work for 114, give them 250. Uh, or have them come back to you with, uh, come back with a plan to spend another 136. You know, if they can do great work for 850,000, challenge them to come back with a plan to spend a million and a half. I mean, this is really high impact uh, on the ground, life-changing uh, outcomes and that we really need to lean into. So at least from my personal standpoint, the more of this we can do, uh, the better, the more of this we can enable. Um, it's like, what else do you need from us to do even more and deliver even you know, more impact and higher value? So. Yeah, uh, we we clearly, you know, my vote is to very aggressively, you know, promote the support, you know, we have here. I'm not saying uh, be indiscriminate or other than very intentional and disciplined, but where we see people doing high impact work that are otherwise con- resource constrained, we can be a solution for that. So make sure in your messaging um that uh you know we're, we're here to be a partner not just a funder uh, we will we will absolutely message that chair and i appreciate the support that you've expressed and that the board has expressed ever since um you know we we made our first application to you so thank you very much for that okay um any other questions for Lori? thoughts comments well Cecily and I right. both have our hands up. Lori, could Go you ahead, tell me? Oh, sorry. Hello. Yeah. yeah Cecily <laughs> and B. Apologies. Yeah, you got your, my bad. So, Lori, just remind me what those touch points are, um, what those evaluation points are for you in order for you to move forward with doing as the chairman has suggested, which is rewarding good work, right? Yeah, so they have we have certain milestones, you know, the the entities all provide us a budget, they have to provide us an actual plan. 
They provide us, you know, interim milestones that they've been achieving. Um, you know, sometimes it's not so easy to get uh, paperwork from all of the from all of the vendors, but they need to demonstrate enrollment. They need to demonstrate job placement, apprenticeships. They need to demonstrate that they have partnered with employers in the vicinity, so that you know we know that the training is actually going to result in employment. They um, show us their payrolls with regard to hiring instructors. So there are there are several touch points along the way, and um, Sandra Blackman will have multiple conversations with um, all of these entities to make sure that they one stay on track, and two is if they're having issues staying on track, then we can also help them with regard to that, and we can leverage our resources to make sure that they do stay on track. And we like to track the people who are graduating from these programs, so we can see where they are being employed to make sure that you know that it is a success story. So B and I basically thought the same and had the same type of questions, but adding adding on to that a little bit, um, as a board member, I love hearing from the people that are impacted by what we're doing at whatever level it is, but this particularly, how um, good it would be to hear maybe from one of the programs running these uh, trainings, but also participants. If there are any that want to give us a, a video and come in and talk to us about the impact of these programs on on the people they're helping or the people who have been helped, because um, I think that's also personal experience is the best way to learn if we're doing this right, if we can do it better. Um, as uh, the chair said, uh, if it's going really well, we've got to expand this within our um, authority um, in other places around the state. So I'm hoping that that's one of the impact touchstones that we'll be able to see uh, shortly in the future from these programs. So, so we can absolutely arrange for that. And, and I will tell you that the two entities that we have already funded um, through your authorization, uh, whenever we speak with them, the first thing they say is thank you so much for your support. I mean, they say it repeatedly because it actually is having a real impact for them and so that they can help their local community. So they would be honored and more than happy, I am sure, to come before the board and talk about what they do, honestly, in the hopes that you will give them more money, um, <laughs> which is a good thing. So we can absolutely arrange that and um, participants in the program can demonstrate how we have helped them, how we have you know, opened up a light so that they understand that there is a career pathway in the clean energy field, in the construction trade, especially, or with you know, uh, refrigerants or the heat pump installation or EV chargers. I mean, those are all like very real career career pathways. And if we can help people earn a family sustaining wage, I think they would be more than happy to come in and, and we can share in their success story. So we can absolutely make that happen. Oh, good news, Lori. But, you know, you've, you've found another barrier, right, that you mentioned that's really important. And that is that these community-based organizations sometimes have capacity issues around reporting. Sure. And reporting back and so it's really i'm yep. really glad that you're paying attention to that so thank you very much you're very welcome and, and what else we can do to you know expedite or facilitate that uh i couldn't agree more with b's point there it's a barrier and we need to knock down barriers not create barriers so what can what can we do to make that evaluation you know easier for them and ultimately more productive so Again, that's why I said we want to be a partner, not just a funder. Um, yep, uh, understood. And, okay. I was like, we and we've simplified that paperwork, uh, Chair and uh, Trustee Gonzalez. To that point, we've simplified the paperwork so that it's not bureaucratic because these are small community-based organizations and they're not sophisticated enough to do right. some of that. So we simplified it, and we and we do help them to try and make sure that they complete the paperwork, you know, as we need it to make sure that. Um, that they will hit certain touchstones. So we are doing all that we can to make sure that that they succeed because then we all succeed. Thank you. Agree. Okay, I think we need a motion for the two and a half million. So, Is that correct, Laura? Uh, Dennis, somebody moved. Uh, somebody moved it. Cecily second. There's everybody's in there. Uh, Karen will sort it out. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 
Any opposed? Motion carried with a strong endorsement to uh, make it easy and make it work. So well done, Lawrence. Uh, we look forward to Thank hearing. You. What, there's another 11 requests that you're evaluating. Yes, that's correct. We're in negotiations with 11 remaining vendors. Okay, great. And continuing to promote uh, the opportunity. So correct. hopefully can e even see or hear from more. Great. Okay, uh, pivoting uh, to the ops, uh, operations uh, side, we got Frank and Dave with uh, a couple contract uh, award uh, resolutions. I think Frank's up uh, first. All right, can you check the mic? Hopefully you can hear me. It's working. Great, okay. That's what we'll take that All right, good morning, Mr. Chairman, trustees, NIPA colleagues, and members of the public. My name is Frank Ronsi. I'm the Vice President of Engineering at NIPA. And today we are requesting the Finance Committee recommend approval of 14 five-year personal services contract awards to the entities listed on the slide in the aggregate amount of $25 million uh, to the Board of Trustees for the October meeting. Uh, the authority's current set of value contracts of this nature expire in October of this year. And these new contracts will help us maintain uh, continuity of execution. The authority's annual portfolio requires a variety of engineering services to support project execution, including but not limited to electrical, civil, structural, and mechanical engineering, as well as several specialties such as protection and control, transmission engineering, and hydrology. These services in the new on-call contracts include but are not limited to engineering and design, project scoping, design alternatives analysis, failure analysis, and repair recommendations. In March of 2024, a request for a proposal was issued and 35 proposals were received. A cross-functional evaluation committee conducted an extensive evaluation of each bidder's service capabilities, relevant experience, safety program, MWBE and SDVOB compliance and commercial terms. The evaluation committee recommends on-call contract awards to the vendors listed in the aggregate amount of 25 million for the five-year term. And many bids will be conducted among these set of contracts as specific scopes of works are developed. Uh, one correction I do need to point out on the slide is that it is one of 14 firms are qualified as MBE firm, but however, all selected firms were committed to meeting the authority's development uh, supplier goals. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Uh, Frank, so the 21 that didn't make the cut, uh, they didn't make the cut for a wide range of reasons. They thought they were qualified. We didn't. Give us some perspective on that. Sure. Yes, Mr. Chairman, there were uh, a number of reasons, variety of them. Some of them are technical qualifications. They did not meet the scope of service, which really was around the heavy infrastructure power renewables uh, work that NIPA does, as well as a variety of them took uh, a number of exceptions to our commercial terms that we could not come to agreement on. And then the MWB, uh, one out of 14, so we're operating in the 6 7%. Is that reflective of the industry? Uh, if we looked industry wide, um, would we see only 5 6% uh, representation? Uh, are we doing better with one out of 14? Are we doing worse? Thoughts on that one? So from my experience, I'd say that it's uh, typical at this level, but at, at uh, each of these firms also tend to employ more specialized sub consultants on the large projects we have. And that is where we probably see a greater representation is at that specialty level. Uh, smaller, more agile firms is, is where we see that. But uh, we do work very closely with SSM on engaging those firms uh, for, for other services and trying to go through the supplier diversity programs to bring in, meet with NIPA um, for future work and understanding of how to develop those skills. Uh, and, and Frank, in your in your numbers, is it in uh, MWBE? Where where would veteran-owned firms fall? Um, are there veteran-owned firms in these fourteen? Uh, there are not. Of the thirty-five proposed firms, three were uh, MBE. Uh, there were no SDVOBs in that thirty-five. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the numbers aren't 
I mean, and, and at this, what have we done historically in this area, uh, Frank? Is that consistent with, or you're saying it's, it's at our level, uh, we just can't get the expertise in uh, minority owned firms? We do, we do tend to see that as the sub consultants. So while we may not see it at the prime firms here listed, we do often see that at uh, se several MBE firms will be sub consulted for specialty work, right? Some of the uh, very unique work tend to be where I think we've seen more of the MBE firms, uh, MWB firms come through on projects. Most projects require not just one firm, but a multitude of services. So uh, these tend to be the, um, the, the primes on these projects and will engage for those specific scopes of work, uh, sub-consultant work that is specific to uh, unique areas that that is where we tend to see the MWBE firm engagement much higher than at this level. Uh, pivoting just a bit, so the 14 that we've selected, um, are those, have we done work with the, all 14 in the past? Are there some newbies here? I mean, is this a closed uh, group? Or uh, have, are, do we, in fact, uh, you know, have new players uh, on the roster of 14? Uh, Mr. Chairman, there are several new players. Um, some are new to the existing value contract suite that is expiring. Only 14, oh, only four of the 14 are repeat from our past power engineering contract that's expiring in October. However, a number of the firms have been engaged with NIPA in other uh, transmission substation type work or other contracts. Uh, and the, okay. but there are a number of firms that are new to NIPA. Yes. Okay. All right. Great. Other questions, thoughts for Frank? If not, I'd ask for a motion to recommend this uh, item for adoption by full board. So move. Second. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Lewis. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Thanks, Frank. David. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, trustees. NIPA colleagues, pleasure to be with everyone today. Mr. Chairman, just circling back on your previous inquiry on canals, uh, the canal season will, co will close on October 16th this year, so four weeks and a day from now. The okay. season opened on May, on May 17th, and as Joe mentioned, uh, the traffic is down about 9% uh, through the first week in September. But if you recall, we had Hurricane Debbie where parts of the system were actually shut down uh, the first and second week of August. Um, so the, you know, the vessel counts are lock passage, basically, or in fact, you know, mo a lot of significant amount of use of the system happens without folks going through a lock. So it's just a number. It's uh, in my eyes, it's very considering the storm is very similar to last year and you know, things from an overall perspective are going fairly well this summer. Okay, great. Thank you for that update. Okay, so this is a recommendation of a contract award uh, surrounding statewide structural inspection support services for the Canal Corporation uh, in the amount of 25 million over a five-year term to the seven firms listed on the slide. Uh, the backdrop is that Canals uh, owns a significant amount of civil and engineering infrastructure um, and assets, over 2,600 approximately, over 900 of which are water impounding assets. Uh, we have a, you know, an aging infrastructure that requires routine inspection. We have a fairly robust inspection program wherein you know, virtually all assets, uh, not all, but virtually all assets are inspected on a periodic basis. And depending upon the condition of the assets, the frequency um, increases. So you might start off inspecting an asset every five years, and then that might turn into every two years, depending upon its declining condition. The approval of this contract will allow us to retain qualified engineering firms to, um, to basically fulfill the obligations of the inspection program we have. 
in effect, informing the Canal Corporation and NIPA as to the condition of the entire portfolio, uh, which, which also informs our capital program and our reaction to emer various emergent needs. This is a critically important contract. Uh, the current contract is coming to a close in December. Uh, that was a three-year uh, initial term with a two-year extension that closes this December. Um, and, you know, in addition to the what I'll call routine inspection work that goes along with our program, uh, the 25 million encompasses approximately 4 million uh, that is earmarked to expand the program. So there are some assets which do not have a history of inspection at canals um, or do not have a, ro a robust enough hi history of inspection. For example, upland disposal sites where we um, place the dredge material from the canal system. Mechanical and electrical systems are another area that I think needs to be shored up a little. So we are, we're gonna expand the program to some other critical um, assets or parts of our assets. And the 25 million will allow us to do that for the next five years. Um, in May of this year, we um, solicited bids from uh, 25 suppliers. We received seven qualified uh, bid, seven bids all seven of which were qualified. That's what we received. Uh, three of those bids are returning vendors, four are new. And the proposal is to basically um, award this contract to all seven. And uh, similar to what Frank had mentioned, you know, all our proposals were thoroughly evaluated by a cross-functional team. Um, you know, service capability, relevant experience, team staffing, safety risk record, proposal content, so on and so forth. Um, and there is a there are DB requirements here as well. Um, I think similar to what Frank mentioned, um, thirty six percent overall, fifteen percent um, minority, fifteen percent women, and six percent service disabled disabled veterans. And uh, so that's it. So now I can take any questions if you have any. So only seven qualified. So we're de dealing with a limited pool and. And you're taking advantage of all qualified players. Yes, and, and the last uh, the last contract had five firms, and we had actually sought to um, to get seven or eight on this contract, considering the expansion that I mentioned. So we ended up with seven. All right. Well, good. Any questions uh, for David? All right, otherwise I ask for a motion to recommend this item to the full board for adoption. So moved. All right, Second. thanks, Dennis. Please. Second. Thank you very much. Uh, unless there's any other questions, all in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Thanks a lot, David. Yep. All right, uh, one last uh, item on our agenda is uh, the consent materials. Uh, hopefully everyone had uh, an opportunity uh, to review in advance. And unless you have any other questions, I'd be happy to entertain a motion to adopt the consent agenda as presented to us. So moved. Thanks, Dennis. Second, please. Second. All right, thanks, Lori. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. And with that, unless there's any other matters to come before us, uh, I'm pleased to uh, ask for a motion to close uh, this Joint Finance Committee meeting. So moved. Thanks, Laurie. Second? Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Our next uh, finance committee is in a couple months, uh, middle of November. Uh, and uh, obviously, as we referenced, we're going to have a short, uh, quote unquote, special board meeting uh, following this meeting. And uh, then we'll reconvene um, at, and risk those of us that are on risk committee. Okay, okay thanks very much, everyone.